My name is Newton, um, and after that introduction, Dubai makes me feel like a celebrity. But, um, therapeutics Pharma Division, and it's been an honor actually. I just realized this year marks my 24th year in the industry, um, and I've worked with people like Dr. Dan here uh, for so many years. So he has seen me grow from a very young uh, medical rep. I was given a very interesting task, and I, and I thought that um, I'm not managing the supply chain aspect of my business, but I want to share with you, with you when we put everything together that we have learned, I believe yesterday and today, how does it translate to what we see every single day? Uh, Philips, and just go to the first, yes. So this is Philips, just a very quick overview. We have been in existence for about the two years. We are an ISO certified company uh, with approximately 68 partners. So you can imagine how much supply chain management that we do. Uh, we have about 538 employees and we have um, in fact 10 go downs in total uh, and the space is about 5,500 square meters um, air conditioned and we also have similarly vehicles that are also um, sort of wired for that distribution. Uh, we started in 1991, just a very quick overview. Uh, we had the first company spin-off in 2000 known as Specialties. This was dedicated to our partners, especially from the sub-Asia continent. And then we had Philips Healthcare Technologies, which was focusing on uh, medical devices. And in 2008, we had Philips Healthcare Services, which actually has worked very closely with Chemonics in procurement and uh, supply chain management. We still do actually work very closely with Meds and uh, Kemsa uh, in last mile delivery, especially of commodities in um, uh, viral load testing. And then 2013, we had uh, the last baby, which was known as Wessex, uh, which was focused on retail, uh, retail chain outreach. And lastly, just a very quick one, in 2020, we had uh, an image into Philips Therapeutics. So we, we had been known for a long time as Philips Pharmaceuticals, but it really just to incorporate what we felt at that time we represented not just pharmaceuticals, but also many other um, aspects here, including biologicals, medical devices, um, and as Dr. Mbao has put it also in leadership. Uh, next slide. That's our corporate office. It's in Nine West. I just wanted to highlight that you will see we have a training center, a dedicated training center. We've actually been the first probably distributor that has worked very closely with the industry. Uh, we have been training young graduates, both in medicine and pharmacy from 2015. Uh, usually we, we only took a break uh, due to COVID-19. What that has helped us is to provide what we felt was an industry-linked training uh, to these new graduates so that what they could have missed, especially in their graduate course, they could be able to uh, get that. And we work with a lot of partners in that. And as I said, it also does incorporate leadership training, which we have uh, taken up. Next slide. Yeah, and I, I guess coming to supply chain, we, we sort of go through this uh, vigorously with 68 partners you can imagine the kind of planning that we we have to do um, and what that has meant is that we have to really balance delicately both in terms of the demands of the market the forecast and for us who work in distribution we also have focus that are given by sales that was saying it comes to focusing being an art you have to be very careful because a salesperson will tell you they'll promise you that this product that you're bringing in will not even last two months and then before you realize it you have many months down the line and the commodity is still sitting with you. So there's a balance. We, of course, supply the public sector and we supply the private sector. And what that has meant is us being able to really fine tune this. And we have the benefit, obviously, of the two years of doing that. And I'll share very quickly about the stories that I believe has uh, given us a head start on this. Uh, so just keep in mind the 68 partners. Next slide. Let me start with the end-to-end -end supply chain analytics forecasting. As I said, probably for the last 10 years, we now use a lot more data. We use SAP ourselves. And what that has enabled is that we have a dedicated team that is independent uh, from the sales and marketing team that looks at the run rate of the products or the commodities that we have. They then sort of have a system-generated forecasting. This is then given to the marketing team, which then reviews and gives their input. What that has allowed us is to be able to integrate uh, both what is a realistic forecasting, meaning what is actually uh, coming from the system in terms of what we are selling out, but also factoring in, are there any anticipated changes that also may take place? That also means that even when it comes to risks, we are able to factor in that. And I want to give you a very interesting story. As I said, I want to share a 
couple of stories in my presentation. During COVID-19, we saw something very interesting. There was a huge rise in people that got diagnosed with diabetes for whatever reason. And what that meant is that, because we represent Nova Nordisk here in Kenya, is that the demand for insulin shot up quite significantly. Before COVID, we had a very clear lead times, you know, which we could work with. If we had, whether it was a supply, um, an order for the public sector or the private sector, I think we planned well in terms of ensuring that we didn't go out of stock. But those of you who are probably um, in the industry would know that in the last two years, we've struggled for the first time even getting out of stock with something as important as Mixtad. And the reason is really because of what has happened at the global level. So sometimes, even when you plan, you keep in mind that certain things that actually do I mean, uh, from the environment disrupts that planning. And for us, you've seen that with, um, with insulin. And I can't say that we are actually yet on track. Sometimes we find that the insulin that is being manufactured is not even adequate to meet the global demand. So you're queued, of course, depending on the volumes. And sometimes we are fighting against Brazil, which you can imagine the volumes of insulin that they are taking. So that's one of the practical impacts of uh, supply chain planning and what we have seen from our context. Next slide. The, the second thing that I would say that came in as a result of COVID-19 really was, and I, I didn't see this myself, is how uh, things like raw materials would impact on supply chain. Um, and this year, in fact, we've seen one of our clients who supplies us, you will not believe it, but these are pessaries actually, and they could not get one of the commodities which was really resulting from the, the war that is Russia and Ukraine. This is a French manufacturer. And so we are not able to plan. We can have our focus in terms of the quantities that we need for the market. But we're not able to get. Again, we are queued. And sometimes you don't the quantity that you actually need. So that has not helped with the fact that, of course, we've also had a global economic crisis, increasing inflation, uh, now at about 9.5%. The weekend in Kenya shilling, which also has meant that our prices have really been impacted. I think we've seen as distribution last four months, price changes almost every two or three months because, you know, for us, 100% of what we sell, actually, we import it and we pay it in foreign currency. So if you're paying, especially using the British pound, which is now getting to 100, the dollar is 145, and the euro also is not, um, is strengthening against the Kenya shilling. That really has a big impact. But let me give you an interesting story also of how certain things can have a huge impact in terms of your supply chain. We do represent a partner known as Hexagon, which is one of the biggest companies in India, which deals in clinical nutrition, and we bring the products by sea. Uh, we are properly focusing, I might say, uh, bearing in mind the lead times. And what happened is that the products were manufactured, uh, went through the process. Remember, for nutritional products, they tend to have a very short shelf life, like all food supplements. Unfortunately, when the ship left India it by Colombia, and it got stuck. Who remembers the story about the ship that got stuck, for example, at Suez Canal? You remember? Something very similar in Colombia. And now you can imagine this is a product that comes in with a shelf for about maybe 12 months. And the, the ship is stuck um, in Colombia. And you're not certain how long it will take. By the time the ship was getting to Mombasa here, we had about six months shelf life remaining. Now, it's completely disrupted our planning. Uh, we have to negotiate with our Kemsa. Uh, KNH, most of the public hospitals, and explain why we have to supply a product now that is probably about six months shelf life. And you find, for example, like in Kemsa, the system is configured. It doesn't prevent products that have less than six months shelf life. So what do you do? And, and those are some of the realities when it comes to supply chain that have really sort of come into force, especially after COVID-19. Next slide. So I guess most of us here are probably familiar with these key metrics that we look at in supply chain. Uh, the on-time delivery, the inventory to sales ratio, current cost of inventory, the purchase, order tracking, days of sales of inventory, the first cost uh, per ton shipped, which has a huge impact. For example, when we have to import uh, products, especially on named patient basis, which are very small quantities, but you still have to pay very high freight and you have to explain uh, to the patient, perfect order delivery uh, rate and supply on time delivery. I want to pick one thing here, which is point number five. Um, which indicates managing your inventory or the inventory that you have is difficult to sell. But one other challenge that we have encountered is where organizations that we represent make corporate decisions at a high level. And they decide, for example, that we 
no longer want to be present in Africa, exiting. But you had focused and ordered your commodities without that, in, in, without that knowledge in mind. So what happens is now you're frantically trying to negotiate. So what happens? And we've seen, most of you are familiar, for example, some of the Dutch companies um, have actually, not Dutch, Danish companies, have actually exited both India and, uh, and Africa. So it becomes very difficult because not only do you have stock that you have to sit with, but once the company decides to pull out, usually also means that the demand creation of that product also is impacted. And that, of course, completes your uh, planning and supply chain into a disarray. And sometimes this can, ha can come with very high costs. Luckily, of course, you'd have to go through the contracts to manage that. But it takes a while, for example, even before you are compensated. And sometimes you do you do. Next slide. However, even as I sort of bring this into a close, one of the things that we have learned, especially working with some of the global partners, is the things that we really need to focus on to make sure we have the kind of supply chain system that guarantees our clients that they are getting good products. One of them is integrated temperature monitoring, which guarantees end-to-end -end compliance and maintenance of product efficacy. Somebody talked here in the morning, especially about products, for example, like insulin and how they are transported. An independent validation of temperature mapping uh, from receiving bay, a storage warehouse, and even warehouse. You will not believe it, but when, in one of our audits that we had with a Japanese company, they literally measured the temperature in our receiving bay. And it's an audit finding, you can imagine. And so you have to make sure that even where you're receiving the product, you can be able to guarantee the temperature. And being able to demonstrate uh, systems that can also trigger an alarm should there be a temperature excursion. We were audited on one of our motorbikes and our trucks. Now, I, I like what the first speaker was talking about in terms of uh, blockchain. You know, we have these cargo people that come in and tell you they have a product that they have with and it's probably cheaper. We had one case where a patient was sold a frozen insulin. The case is still at the Pharmacy and Poisons Board today. Uh, I guess under the usual government investigation. But the point is, uh, these systems are so important. They have an impact in terms of the efficacy of the products that the patient will get. And as I said, if you cannot be able to demonstrate that the motorbike that is delivering that insulin or the cold chain product actually can be monitored or has the right temperature mapping, then how do you guarantee the efficacy of the product when it finally lands onto the patient? Let me go to my second last slide. So if we, if we look at what does the future represent, I sort of see four things that I think are very important from where I sit as an active participant in terms of supply chain management. Number one is supply security, compliance, and regulation. I've sort of merged it together, although these are two big topics. You need to be able to guarantee that supply security. And as I said, there are so many factors now that affect this. What will actually play a key role? I think a lot of the speakers before me have mentioned data analytics. Um, regulatory laws that need to be harmonized. Um, these are very critical to make sure that we also have a, flair, a, a fair playing ground, really, for all the suppliers uh, in the country and in the region. The second one is sourcing and demand planning. As I said, this really is important. Uh, I cannot overemphasize what SAP has done for us. You know, we, we do not do a lot of the crystal ball um, uh, checking to see whether we need to order more or less. And yes, we have, as an organization, you can imagine being around for 32 years, you know, have uh, suffered uh, a huge impact in terms of poor forecasting. It does happen. Uh, one time I remember a sales team uh, promised to liquidate a product which was for, um, I believe it was anemia, imatinic, and the forecast that had been given was a full container, you can imagine. And five years later, you are half the container, and the shelf life now is ready, gone. The person who promised, by the way, has left the organization. Uh, and you can't go after them or their new employer to say this person made a promise. Um, so it's, it's really important to keep that uh, in mind. I, I say price pressure is, you know, unfortunately, there's a very little we can do when this is being impacted by the global dynamics. But I must say, you know, we are bracing ourselves as we speak, for example, that the dollar can even go to as high as 150 by June and probably 180 by the end of the year. That's what the bankers are saying. But what, what does that mean uh, for the cost of the commodities to the the patients how then will they be able to afford what do we need to do uh, to uh, to mitigate this the government doesn't come out and talk about things like medicines and pricing and i believe medicines the same way we are 
uh, having people even protesting about the price of unga and sugar is really as important because there are people whose livelihoods depend on this insulin that they have to take every day. And if what they were buying at 480 shillings, now they are buying at 800, going to 1,000, who then speaks for that patient? Lastly, sustainability. And I see this becoming probably much more relevant now because globally people want to know whether as an organization you're also giving back in terms of environmental um, benefit. And of course, shifting where possible to using um, air, I mean using ship or by sea instead of air to reduce your carbon footprint. We've actually got an organization here in Kenya that has asked us for our carbon footprint report. So I see that being the next thing that's really going to become very important even in supply chain in the future. And lastly, uh, my last slide, what have we learned in Philips over the last 32 years? Again, for us it's technology that really has become very important and we are trying to adopt this to the last mile. I see where the speakers today have been talking about and unfortunately, as I say, we don't really work together. Maybe as has been a challenge to the PSK uh, CEO, we need to find a way in which the retail pharmacists can agree to actually share data. It's in their interest, I must say. But if we can be able to have technology that is end to end, I think it will help everybody. Uh, finally, number two is, of course, as I said, we have seen, uh, having worked with uh, global partners, the importance of making sure that your entire ecosystem, the warehouse distribution, really complies with the global standards. That way, we cannot be challenged that the product giving here is any less in terms of the way it was stored, distributed uh, to the patient, you know, just any other country in the world. Lastly, pharmaceutical experts in the warehouse distribution and logistics. I echo what I think some of the speakers have said here in the morning. To date, I see challenge, and I'll challenge again the, the PSK CEO that we don't see a lot of pharmacists. And if, you, if I look at us at Philip, and I look at the partners that we work with, both in private and the public hospitals, you find that even in their uh, procurement, department you don't have as many pharmacists you probably have one uh, and i think we have adequate pharmacists that can be able to play that role um, and not just people who've only done supply chain and of course being able to integrate data in terms of application for forecasting uh, regulatory approval importation warehouse management one of the biggest challenges we face for example sometimes is we cannot predict how soon we'll get our import permits even from the pharmacy and poison spot even though in some cases you find that you need urgent supply We've had instances where there's no insulin. PPB writes to me and tells me, there's no insulin. Can you explain? I have an input permit that is pending from PPB. So who do I blame? Yeah. Lastly, I think it's important to future-proof the supply chain ecosystem against emerging unexpected threats. This for sure is something that we cannot ignore. And I think even for institutions like Stratmore and I would say USP that are supporting in terms of that how do we prepare our pharmacists to be in anticipating some of this emerging threat in supply chain? I think that's extremely important. And we've also seen this um, in organization as Philips. I believe the last slide. Just to, next slide, sorry. Just to let you know that, you know, when we have an auto stock, it's not always the mistake of the distributor or the importer. There are so many other factors that really come into play. And I think I've been able to mention that. Keep in mind, as I said, some are outside our control, especially regulatory. And we've seen nowadays, for example, the integration between PPB, uh, customs, KRA. It really becomes quite a big, a complex giant that we have to fight every other time. And I, I want to finish by saying this. We sometimes have our own organizations that are government entities that do not necessarily make it easier. Uh, to have a proper supply chain. We had one partner, for example, that opted to pull out of the country because they could not. It's a European company that was manufacturing uh, sterilizing products and they were asked by KEBS that their products have to be recertified. And the cost of the recertification was half the cost of what they were planning to do in the country. So there is obviously sometimes a mismatch in some of the laws that we have and they do disrupt the supply chain. That's it. Thank you so much.